All right, let's have a look at the 2017 OCR A, A-level physics paper one, modeling physics. Question one, which of the following is a correct unit for gravitational field strength? Any field strength tells you the number of Newtons per unit something. In this case, it's gonna be Newtons per kilogram. Four materials, A, B, C, and D, have the same length and cross-sectional area, force against extension. Which material is brittle and has the greatest ultimate tensile strength? C and D aren't brittle because they are ductile because they start stretching a lot. A and B are brittle, but we can see that B, it ends up higher. It can take a greater force than A. Question three, breaking distance of a car is directly proportional to its initial kinetic energy. Breaking distance of a car is 18 meters when its initial speed is 10 meters per second. What's the breaking distance of the car when the initial speed is 25 meters per second? So we know that the distance is proportional to EK and EK is equals to half mv squared, but the mass is staying the same, so we can say that ultimately d is proportional to v squared. So if that's the case, then we can say d1 over v1 squared equals d2 over v2 squared. We're trying to find d2. So that means that it's going to be equals to this. So that's 25 squared times the initial distance, which is 18, divided by 10 squared, which is 100. That gives us 113 meters. Let's see. Ball is dropped from rest above ground. Air resistance has negligible effect on the motion of the ball. Speed of the ball is V after it's fallen distance right here. Right Which graph is correct for this falling ball? Well, we know that as something falls, GPE turns into kinetic energy, KE. So we can see that H is proportional to V squared. They've been cheeky here because H implies that it's a height, but actually H is the distance fallen from its point of release. So as H gets bigger, V squared is going to get bigger as well. So it's not gonna be C, it's not gonna be D, and we know that they're proportional, so A is the right answer. Which is the best estimate of the area of a rectangular field of length 98 plus or minus three meters and width 47 plus or minus two meters? Okay, so we can see that all of these answers are pretty much the same. However, we only have data to two sig figs. So it can't be D because we've gone to a greater precision there. But also just have a look. If you have 98 plus or minus three times 47 plus or minus two, are we really saying that that is only gonna result in a plus or minus six meters squared uncertainty? Well, let's have a look. We know that if we're multiplying things together, we need to use percentage uncertainties. This is about 3%, and this 2 meters out of 47 is about 4%. So altogether, if we're multiplying the sides, we're going to have a 7% uncertainty. So 4,600 times 0 0.07, and that gives us 322. It's not going to be either of these. It's going to be C. Six, the flat end of a uniform steel cylinder of weight that is glued to a horizontal ceiling. Cylinder hangs vertically. The breaking stress of the glue is that. The glue only just holds the cylinder to the ceiling. So it might seem complicated, but it really isn't because we know that stress is force by area. Pascals is Newtons per meter squared. So if we have a force and we have a stress, we're just trying to find area. Swap over these two and we end up with force by stress. This is gonna be 7.8 by 1.3 times 10 to the five. And I can already see just looking by the powers of 10, that's gonna be B. Question seven, the intensity against wavelength graph of an object at 750 degrees peaks at a wavelength of lambda. Temperature of the object is raised to 960. What is the wavelength now at the new peak intensity in terms of lambda? We know that the peak wavelength is proportional to one over T. So it's inversely proportional to the temperature. So we can say lambda one, T1 equals lambda 2 T2. We're looking for lambda 2, so let's put T2 under here. Lambda is just one. Lambda one is just one because we're just looking for the ratio, but it does need to be in Kelvin. So we need 750 plus 273 divided by 960 plus 273, turn them into Kelvin, and that gives us 0.83. It's B. Question eight, the diagram shows two opposite vertical forces of magnitude 1.2 and 2.1 acting on an object. Which of the following statements could be correct? Classic case of me not reading the question the first time around. Number one, the object is accelerating and moving up. So if it is moving up, then yes, it's going to be accelerating. Two, the object is decelerating and moving down. Yes, if it's moving downwards at this point, but we have 
the resultant force pointing upwards, it is decelerating, and the magnitude of the resultant force is 0 0.9. That's also correct. So therefore, it's 1, 2, and a 3. Which is 9. Graph of y against distance r from the center of the planet shown below. The graph shows that y is inversely proportional to r squared. Which quantity is best represented on the y-axis of the graph? Okay, so this is r in megameters. Now be careful because that looks like big M, little m, which is what we have in Newton's law of gravitation. So that's a little bit awkward. Which of these falls away according to r squared? What about the period of a satellite orbiting the planet? Kepler's law disproves that. Gravitational potential of the planet. Well, no, gravitational potential is proportional to one over r, not one over r squared. Gravitational field strength of the planet. Yes, we know that g is equal to minus gm over r squared. It falls away with r squared, so it looks like that's correct. Finally, kinetic energy of a satellite orbiting the planet. No, that's not true. Question 10, part of the line spectrum for light from the sun is shown below. Which spectrum best shows light from a similar star to the sun? All right, so we know that if a star is further away from the sun, which they all have to be, it means that they are generally red shifted. So that means the wavelength should have increased. So all of the wavelengths should have increased a similar proportion. So have a look at this. This wavelength has moved this far, this one this far, this one this far. They've all red shifted pretty much the same amount. So it's going to be A. Now the mark scheme does say that the answer is B because yes, technically, the bigger the wavelength, the bigger effect redshift has on it. However, it should not be nearly as prominent as this. You look up any red shifted line spectrum for hydrogen and it doesn't look like this. So even though the mark scheme says B, I would say A. Basically, it's just a little bit mean than putting both in here at the same time. 11. Tensile force of 4.5 newtons is applied to spring extends elastically by 3.2 centimeters. What is the elastic potential energy of the spring? We know that E, 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 that's elastic potential energy, is equal to half F, X. Half times the force times the extension, half times 4.5 times 3.2 times 10 to the minus two. Okay, so we can see that all the numbers are different, so we can probably just do this without calculating it. So, so we have a half times 4.5, so let's say that's like 2.25, two and a quarter, times 3.2, it's gonna give us a number between six and eight, isn't it? So it can't be any of these three, it has to be A. 12, an object above the ground is released from rest. What is the distance traveled by the object between 0.2 and 0.3 seconds? Okay, so we're looking for two distances, so we're looking for S2 take away S1. We're going to be using UT plus half AT squared. And we know that UT disappears. So we're looking for half A, and then we can factorize T2 squared take away T1 squared. It's going to be half times 9.8 times 0 0.3 squared minus 0 0.2 squared. It's going to be half times 9.8 times 0 0.09, take away 0 0.04, it's half 9.8 times 0 0.05, and that gives us 0.245 meters. 13, the puck of mass, 0 0.16 kilograms, is sliding on ice with the velocity of that. A hockey stick exerts a force on the puck, short period of time, in the opposite direction to the velocity of the puck. The momentum of the puck changes by 2 kilogram meters per second. Ignore friction. Thanks, we will. What is the speed of the puck when it leaves the hockey stick? Okay, so we have a change in momentum, change in P, also known as impulse. And that's equals to m v2 minus v1. Momentum afterwards, take away momentum before. But let's be careful here because it's going in the opposite direction. We're trying to find the second speed. So here we go. The change in momentum or the impulse divided by the mass plus the initial speed will give us the second velocity. We are talking velocity here not just speed. So I nearly fell into the trap there. Let me just show you what happened. I forgot that the change in momentum is actually minus two because the puck is going to the right, let's say at 11 meters per second, we're providing impulse in the opposite direction. So it has to be minus two. So you have to be really careful with that. So let's do minus two divided by 0 0.16 plus 11, and that gives us minus 1.5 but we are just looking for the speed, so 1.5 is fine. 14, a container has an ideal gas. In it, I assume, the mean square speed of the gas molecules in the container is three times 10 to the five meters squared per second squared. Over a period of time, a third of the gas molecules escape from the container. 
pressure and the volume of the gas in the container remains the same. What is the mean square speed of the molecules left in the container? So we know from our gas law that PV equals third NMCRMS squared. This is our mean square speed not our root mean square speed. So we're looking for C squared here. So if the pressure and the volume stay the same, but we've lost a third, that means that N is decreasing. So we can say that N1 C1 squared equals N2 C2 squared. And we're trying to find C2 squared. So taking this over the other side, we end up with our new mean square speed, N over N2, that's just gonna be three halves times three times 10 to the five, one and a half times this, that gives us C. 15, which two quantities are related in Hubble's law? Well, the graph we have is D against V, and we have a nice straight line, is distance and velocity of galaxies. Section B, question 16, figure 16 shows a hydraulic jack used to lift a car, which has a mass of that. Mechanic exerts a downwards force of that. Handle of the jack moving it 80 centimeters downwards. As he moves the handle, the car rises two centimeters. Calculate the work done by the 400 Newton force exerted by the mechanic. For work done, we're looking for force times distance. So nice, easy question to begin with. 400 times our 0 0.8, that gives us 320 joules. Next, we are asked to calculate the ratio speed of handle moving down divided by speed of car moving up. So this is a little bit of a cheeky question because, because speed is meters per second, but we know that the time is gonna be the same for both. This is just equal to the ratio of the distances moved. So the handle is moving 80 centimeters, the car is rising two centimeters. So this is just gonna be 80 divided by two. So that's 40. Calculate the useful work done on the car and hence the percentage efficiency of the jack. Okay, so we need to find out how much work was done on the car pushing it upwards. Again, E equals FD. And so F in this case is gonna be MG. So we're looking for MGD. So that's 1,200 times 9.8 times the distance that it rise, that's 0 0.02. That gives us 235 joules. Efficiency therefore, any percentage is the bit divided by the lot. So we want the useful energy out divided by the total energy in times 100. That gives us 74%. 17, a group of students are conducting an experiment to determine the value of absolute zero by heating a fixed mass of gas. The volume of the gas is kept constant. The gas is heated using a water bath, temperature, yada, yada, yada. The results from the students are shown in the table, temp against pressure. Describe and explain how the students may have made accurate measurements of the temperature theta. And for that standard question, we're gonna have a thermometer in the water. Thermometer or temperature probe in the water close to the flask. One thing as well though is that you might not have a uniform spreading out of the heat in the water so we're going to say water could be stirred to ensure uniform distribution of heat. The figure shows the pressure gauge. Measurements of P can be made using the KPA scale or the PSI scale. Students measured using the PSI scale to measure pressure and then converted the reading to pressure in kilopascals. Suggest why it was sensible to use the PSI scale to measure P. Interesting question. So we can see here that we have more lines on the PSI scale than we do for KPA. So we can say that the resolution, or we could say precision, is greater. Easy. Students made a reading of P of 37 plus or minus 0 0.5 PSI when theta was 44.1 degrees C. Convert this value of P from PSI to KPA. Complete the table for the missing value of P. Include the absolute uncertainty in P. Yowzers. Okay, so we have 37 PSI. So we can say the pressure in KPA is gonna be 37 times 4.448. That gives us the number of Newtons and then we need to divide that by a square inch. So that's going to be 0 0.0254 meters squared. And that gives us 255,255 kPa. So there we go, we can pop that in. However, we still need to find the uncertainty. So we're gonna to have to use a percentage. So the percentage uncertainty in this value, 0.5 divided by 37, that gives it us in a 
decimal form, ultimately it's 1.35%, but then we times it by our 255 to turn that back into an absolute uncertainty. And that gives us 3.4. So not hugely shocking, this is going to be three as well. Figure 17.3 shows the graph of P against theta. Plot the missing data point and the error bars on the graph. Okay, so we said that was 255, and that was at 44. So we're going from here, two, five, five, bang on there. And we also need error bars going up 0 0.3 and down 0 0.3 like that, easy. Explain what is meant by absolute zero. Describe how figure 17.1 could be used to determine the value of absolute zero. Determine the value of absolute zero, you can assume that the gas behaves as an ideal gas. So absolute zero is the temperature at which particles have no kinetic energy. So we know that PV equals nRT. Therefore, the gradient of our graph equals P over T, but we've got to be wary of the fact that it's actually in kilopascals. So let's find the gradient, shall we? Some nice numbers there. We might as well use the whole triangle. So that's going to be 220 to 280. So that's 60 times 10 to the three pascals divided by a change in temperature of zero to 75. And that gives us 800. Therefore, absolute zero is temperature when P equals zero. So if we treat this graph like a normal straight line graph, Y equals MX plus C, but in this case we have P on the Y axis plus our gradient, I'm just going to like grad, times T, the temperature in degrees Celsius plus the Y intercept, and this happens to be 220,000 pascals. So we want to know what the temperature is when the pressure is zero, that's absolutely zero. So we say zero equals 800, which is our gradient T, plus 2.2 times 10 to the five. Taking this over to the other side, we end up with 800 T equals minus 2.2 times 10 to the five. Therefore, for absolute zero is gonna be this 2.2 times 10 to the five divided by 800. And lo and behold, we end up with minus 275 degrees C. That is absolute zero. D, describe without doing any calculations how you could use figure 17.3 to determine the actual uncertainty in a value of absolute zero in CII. So we could draw lines of worst fit, max and min gradients that cross all error bars. Calculate percentage uncertainty, mean difference from value, Convert into absolute uncertainty. Convert this into an absolute uncertainty in T by multiplying by 275. E, the experiment is repeated as the water bath quickly cools from 70 degrees to five degrees. Absolute zero was found to be minus 390. Compare this value with yours and explain why the values may differ. Describe an experimental approach that can be taken to avoid systematic error in the determination of absolute zero. So if the water bath quickly cools, doesn't necessarily mean that the flask is cooling quickly. So water bath will lose energy more quickly than air in flask. Therefore, pressure will not decrease fast enough for an accurate result. How could we avoid this? To avoid, cool quickly, cool more slowly in order air in flask is always a similar temperature to that of the water. Also, stir the water like we said earlier to ensure uniform distribution of heat, but it's just the other way around this time because the heat is coming out of the flask and into the water. All right, 18. Swimming pool designer investigates depth deep below a water surface reached by a diver when diving from a high H, yada yada. The wooden cylinder has a mass of that, diameter that, and a length that. Calculate the density of the wood. So density is mass over volume. 
So we need to find the volume. So it's a cylinder, so it's gonna be pi d squared over four times the length. So it's gonna be pi over four times one times 10 to the minus four. That's just 1.10, one times 10 to the minus two squared times seven times 10 to the minus two. So ultimately that's gonna give us seven pi times 10 to the minus six divided by four. So therefore the density is gonna be five times 10 to the minus three divided by all of this. We can put the four on top here if you want to. Clearing things up a little bit. So we end up with 20 times 10 to the three, so it's two times 10 to the four divided by seven pi. That gives us 909. So just why wood is an appropriate material to model the depth reached by the diver. So it has a fairly similar density to water and therefore of a diver, as people consist mostly of water. 80% is it, something like that. Cylinder is released from rest from a trap door. Base of the cylinder is a height 0.3 meters above the water surface. Calculate the speed of the cylinder just before it hits the base of the water. So we're looking for suvat. What do we know? We know that U is zero. We know that S is 0.3. We're looking for V and we know that A is 9.8. So V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. U squared disappears because it's zero. So that means that V is the square root of two times 9.8 times 0 0.3. So it's the square root of 0 0.6 times 9.8. We end up with a speed of 2.42 meters per second. Figure 18.2 shows the cylinder fully submerged under the water surface before it's come to a rest. Cylinder is moving vertically down. Add arrows to figure 18.2 to show the three forces acting on the wooden cylinder. Label the arrows. So first things first, we know that we have the weight pulling down. Let's just call that mg. All right, let's put weight there just to be sure. We also know that it is moving downwards. So if it's moving downwards, then we have a drag force that is pulling upwards. And finally, we know that we have up thrust acting on the block as well, due to the pressure of the water. Describe and explain how the resultant force on the wooden cylinder varies from the moment the cylinder is fully submerged until it reaches its deepest point. Well, we are going to say as, as block sinks, up thrust increases. So overall force increases in the upwards direction. And we know that mg is constant. Okay, so the graph shows the depth D reached for different initial drop height H. The designer is required to double the height of a diving board for an existing swimming pool. He suggests that the depth of the pool also needs to be doubled. Use figure 18.3 to explain whether you agree with this suggestion. Let's see what happens when we double our distance, say, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. Here we have an increase to about 0.18, and here we go from 0.18 to 0.24. So we have a distance of 0 0.08 to 0 0.06. So it's not a linear relationship so D is not proportional to H. What we can see happening is that it is going to sort of level off like that, showing that ultimately we're gonna reach a point where it doesn't matter how high you dive from, you're not gonna go any deeper. Data shows that change in D with H decreases at bigger heights. Question 19, the question is about simple pendulum, yada yada. Acceleration is given by minus g over lx. Show the period to the oscillations is given by this. Well, we need to equate this to the standard equation for any SHM, and that is a equals minus omega squared x, or minus two pi f squared x. So if this is equal to minus g over lx, the minuses disappear, the x's disappear, and we end up with, well, let's square everything out, shall we? Four pi squared times f squared, but that's the same as four pi squared over t squared, and that equals g over l. Therefore, the student notices that the amplitude of each oscillation decreases over time. Explain this observation and state what effect this may have on t. Energy is lost due to 
air resistance. That's really the only way that energy can be lost. However, T is not affected as G and L are constant. Does again. Describe with the aid of a label diagram how an experiment can be conducted and how the data can be analyzed to test the validity of the equation T squared equals four pi squared over GL for oscillations of small amplitude. Okay, so we just want to displace Bob less than 10 degrees and release. We want to use fiducial marker at equilibrium to determine when Bob reaches equilibrium. So we have our string here, we have our bob, we have, we have our fiducial marker behind, so that could just be a nail or something like that, it's 10 degrees. This is the length of the string. So we can say measure L from top of string. Now we do need to go to the center of mass. What we then wanna do, change L and record time period. But we don't just measure one time period, Record time for 10 oscillations to obtain a more accurate or reliable result. So we can say collect five results. Then what do we do with the data? Well, we know that T squared equals four pi squared over G L. So if we do a graph of L over T squared, that gives us G over four pi squared. Therefore, graph of L against T squared should give linear and proportional graph, gradient of which equals G over four pi squared. Therefore, check validity of experiment by comparing the value of G with 9.8 meters per second squared. There you go. See, another student conducts a similar experiment in the laboratory to investigate small amplitude oscillations of a pendulum of a mechanical clock. Each tick of the clock corresponds to half a period. Show that the length of the pendulum required for a tick of one second is about one meter. So if tick is one second, time period equals two seconds. So T squared equals four pi squared over G L. Therefore, L equals G T squared by four pi squared. So that's 9.8 times T squared, which is four, divided by four pi squared. Fours cancel. And uh, you might know that pi squared is roughly G, which is kind of freaky. And uh, people think that that's a big conspiracy. And that gives us 0.99. Last bit, if the pendulum clock were to be used on the moon, explain whether this clock would run on time compared with an identical clock on the Earth. No, as G is different. G is 1.6 on the moon, so it's roughly six times less. Therefore, T squared is inversely proportional to G. T will increase by root six. All right, question 20. Plastic kettle is filled with 0.6 kilograms of water at a temperature of 20 degrees, 2.2 kilowatt electric heater, time of four minutes. Currently, the total energy supplied by the heater, the time of four minutes, nice and easy. So we have power times time. So that's 2,200 times four minutes times 60. So that's 8,800 times 60, 5.28. May as well go to two sig figs, seeing that they have as well, 5.3 times 10 to the five. Specific heat capacity is 4,200. Specific latent heat is 2.3 times 10 to the six. Bottom point of water is 100 degrees C. Calculate the mass of water remaining in the kettle after four minutes. Ooh, good question. Assume that all the thermal energy from the heater is transferred to the water. Okay, so let's figure out first energy to get to 100 degrees C. And that is equal to the mass, which is 0 0.6 times 4,200 times the temperature change, which is 80. So that's 2.0 times 10 to the five joules used. 
So that means that we have energy to vaporize stuff is equal to 3.3 .3 times 10 to the five. And we know that's equal to ML. Therefore the mass that's been vaporized is gonna be this by the latent heat. So that's 2.3 times 10 to the six. So that is 0 0.14 kilograms. So 0 0.14 kilograms of water has been vaporized. Therefore, we had 0 0.6 to begin with. So that means that we have 0 0.46 kilograms left. It's a quarter of your water gone. 21, figure 21.1 shows some of the energy levels of electrons, hydrogen, gas atoms. Yeah, yeah. Especially when the energy levels are negative. It's because it depicts potential energy where zero is at the ionization level. Electron makes a transition from C to A. Calculate the energy gained by the electron. Can be easier. Three from four minus zero point eight five. 2.55 electron volts. Calculate the wavelength in nanometers of the photon absorbed by the electron. So E equals HF or HC over lambda. We're looking for lambda, so let's switch these over. Lambda equals HC over E. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times three times 10 to the eight divided by 2.55, but that's electron volts, so it has to be times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Putting that all in, that's 4.9 times 10 to the minus seven meters. But then of course we need to turn that into nanometers. So that's just 490. B, light from a distant galaxy is passed through a diffraction grating. Figure shows a spectrum of light that shows a strong hydrogen alpha emission line. State how an emission line is produced. Electrons fall from a higher energy level to their ground state, emitting photons of a characteristic wavelength. State an adjustment that could be made to the experimental arrangement that could space the emission lines more widely. So if we want more diffraction to happen, we could do two things. We could put the detector further away from the grating or decrease size of the slits in the grating. That will result in more diffraction happening. In the laboratory, the wavelength of the hydrogen alpha emission line the laboratory, the wavelength of the hydrogen alpha emission line is 656.3 nanometers. Use figure 21.2 to determine the recession velocity of the galaxy. Okay, so we need to find the actual reading here. So we can say that this is 661 point, let's go with four, shall we? So the new wavelength is 661.4 nanometers. We don't need to change it into meters because it's just a ratio game. So we know the change in the wavelength compared to the original wavelength is equal to the velocity that the galaxy is moving away from us compared to the speed of light. So let's just pop all of this in then. So we're talking about C times difference in wavelength. So that's 661.4 minus 656.3 over the original. Putting that all in, you have a speed of 2.3 times 10 to the six meters per second. Four, suggest why hydrogen spectral lines play an important role in determining redshift of galaxies. It's because stars consist of hydrogen. See, light from a similar star is viewed in a galaxy further away. The star is part of a pair of stars which orbit a common center of mass. Describe and explain how the equivalent spectrum might appear. Well, if it's a binary star system, so we have these two stars going around, so what's gonna happen is that the stars will be going away from us fast and then towards us, maybe not towards us, but away at a slower rate. So recession velocity would change for the stars. They orbited. So they're not just constantly moving away from us, they're sort of doing that. Therefore, emission line peak would be broader and shorter ultimately because it's broader. That's because wavelengths uh, being shifted different amounts over time. 22, define the internal energy of a substance. This is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies 
of all of its particles. B, block of paraffin wax is melting at a constant temperature of two degrees C. Use the behavior of paraffin molecules to describe and explain the changes to the internal energy of the molecules of the paraffin wax as it melts. As melting is occurring, heat applied does not result in increase in increased kinetic energies, but rather of potential energies to quote unquote break bonds. It's a chemistry way of putting it, but hey, let's try it anyway. 23, write an expression for the gravitational potential at the surface of a planet of mass m and radius r. Vg equals minus gm over r. Show the escape velocity v of a gas molecule is this. Okay, so escape velocity as per usual, we need to equate two energies. So we equate g m m over r two kinetic energy needed, so half mv squared. M's cancel, and so we end up with 2gm over r equals v squared. Therefore, v is 2gm over r. Easy peasy. Calculate the escape velocity v of gas molecules on the surface of Pluto. v equals square root of 2 times g. So 2 times 6.67 .6, times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass divided by the radius, let's cancel some things down, so minus 11, this ends up being 10 to the 12, 1,200 meters per second. Finally, explain why Mercury has no atmosphere while Pluto has a thin atmosphere. Use data from the table to support your explanation. So why not? Let's find out what the escape velocity would be for Mercury. V for Mercury equals, okay, let's just pop it straight in. 2 times 6.67 minus 11 times the mass divided by the radius. That's 4,200 meters per second. So Mercury has a greater escape velocity, but even though escape velocity is greater, distance from Sun is much less. And what is that? So roughly a hundred times less. So if it's a hundred times closer to the sun, much more energy is it receiving? Therefore would receive hundred is times 10 to the two. So 10 to the four times as much or as intense radiation resulting in much faster particles. So if this helped you out, please leave a like, and if you want to go onto paper two, click on the card and I'll see you there.